May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. So this is one of the stories, the, this uh, teaching that Jesus has given that can be read in such different ways as to have an opposite effect, depending on how it's being interpreted. Now, the first part, I think everybody agrees on, and that is that if something happens, if, if somebody, as the word they describe it, sins against you in the congregation, then what's the first thing you're supposed to do? My experience in life would tell me that the first thing you're going to do is call your friend, not the one who sinned against you, mind you, but another friend, and tell them about the offense, who's going to call their friend, and we have a tendency to do this whole gossip thing, so by the end, before the person who has offended against you has ever talked to you, the entire congregation has been brought into the conflict. We've seen it happen. But that's not what we're called to do. If we're going to follow what Jesus has asked us to do, then the first thing we should do is go to the person who has sinned against us, who has offended us, who's doing something uh, problematic or divisive, and talk to them. Now, the scripture as we read it today has uh, a compromise that's been made. It says if a member of the church, or a member of the congregation, but in the original, it would have said brother. Now we say member in order to get rid of the sexist language of brother versus sister, but we lose the familial language that tells us the person who sinned against us is a beloved member of our family. It's not just somebody whose names are on a roll. It's not just somebody who gives a check. It's not just somebody who sits in the choir. This is a beloved member of your family adopted family, the church. And if that, if there's a conflict between you and a beloved member, then that is the first thing that we want to, to heal, that breach. We want to bring that back together so that that brother or sister is saved, so the relationship is saved, so the family is saved. And then, of course, we hear if that person doesn't acknowledge that there was a problem or doesn't change, then we go and bring in the, the trusted advisor. And then of course, if that doesn't work, we go to the whole church. And then we do the last step, which is to teach, treat them as a tax collector or a Gentile. Now, how you read that last piece will tell you a lot about how you've understood Jesus telling you that God is love. Because if you take that piece to mean that that person is now to be shunned, never spoken to again, then that is a different take than I would take, for one. I, you know, I've never been an Amish, I've never known Amish people, but the way they are portrayed in television shows, which I'm sure they don't watch because they don't have TVs, um, the way they do it is if you're shunned, you don't ever talk to them again. You don't ever pass them a, a piece of bread. They are completely out of your life, out of your congregation, out of everything. If we're taking this to mean shunned in that way. But the interesting thing is this is in the book of Matthew. Matthew, who was a tax collector. So if you're going to treat this member as a tax collector in a book written by a tax collector, Perhaps you don't mean shun at all. Perhaps you mean someone who needs to be converted. But maybe at this point we say, okay, we thought this person had understood the message. We thought they were really part of the church and we love them as a brother and we know that they're a beloved child of God, but clearly our catechism did not work well. They have not understood the message. And what would we do if we ran into a Gentile or a tax collector in the world if we were living in this time? We would tell them about Jesus. We would tell them about God's saving grace. We would tell them about what God, God's love for us. We would tell them that they were beloved children of God. We would do everything to bring them in. If they were a tax collector or a Gentile, we didn't know. And apparently what we've discovered when we meet a member of the congregation who will, a brother or sister we thought, who is not willing to 
stay with us, who's not willing to be with us, who's not willing to change their ways, what we need to do is go back and fix the steps we apparently missed in the beginning in their conversion. That this is now a person in our mission field. Now, why would I think that? Because of course you can read it either way. If we went back one verse, so we started with 15, if another member of the church sins against you. But right before that, just in the same conversation, Jesus had been telling the story of the lost sheep. You remember that one? They have a hundred sheep, one walks off. And rather than staying with the 99, they go after the one. And the last line says, so it is not the will of your father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. We live in what we call now cancel culture. So if somebody, if we don't like somebody, if somebody says something we don't like, they're gone, they're dead to us. That's everywhere around us. And, and it's popular, it is so popular in fact, that we have been known to, to cancel, if you will, uh, celebrities or people important who didn't even speak out against somebody else who we were in the middle of canceling. So if they don't wanna shun the same people we wanna shun, then we shun them. It's so fast in social media, it is so fast in our world. And now that we're staying in our homes, a lot of us, social media is our world. You know, we watch television, we look at Facebook, and we listen to music, and we listen to the news, and that's, that's it for a lot of folks. And if you've been absorbed into this cancel culture, if you've been absorbed into the idea that if somebody doesn't agree with you, you just cut them off, that's a different world than the one Jesus invites us into. Jesus invites us into the world where everyone is so precious to God that not even one should be lost. We don't say, well, well, we still have the 99, so we're good. No, we say, where's the 100? Where are all of us? When we are sinning against one another, when we are disagreeing with one another, when we come to a point of disagreement, the goal is not to cut them off and have them out of our lives. The goal is to go and seek them again to see where in our relationship, maybe we, we lost love. Maybe we didn't understand that they were truly part of our lives. Maybe we didn't understand how precious they were to God. Maybe we didn't listen to their point of view. But the goal is not to cancel everyone out of your life or the church or whatever group you're a part of in order to have a purity. The goal is to make sure that everyone is known as a beloved brother and that we correct one another when need be. May God lead us down this path. May we hear his voice when we stand on Jesus's love for us and know that God did not cancel us when we, we sinned. And we are called to forgive as we are forgiven. May God give us grace to live this way. Amen.